Hey guys, I will get started in just a minute. I am going to try to share this live stream in my Facebook group. <clears throat> it is so cold and rainy here, you guys, for Arizona. Um, I just got back from California and I met um, a, my friend, Samantha, who's from North Carolina, and she was like all prepared in California for it to be sunny and we'll, you know, just enjoy the rays, the weather. It wasn't nice there either. I am trying to share this and to share to a group. I don't know why this doesn't work when I do this. It's saying it can't find it. This drives me crazy. Oh, there's someone watching and I'm trying to share this into my group and it's not working. I did it before. And it's saying that it does not search. So I guess I'm going to have to share it later. So tonight I want to talk about hypothyroidism and losing weight when you have a thyroid imbalance. But for those of you who don't know me, my name is Hillary Rank, and I am a health coach, and I help women over 40 look and feel great without deprivation diets or intense workouts. And I have my own thyroid um imbalance issue I started having symptoms of well I didn't know it at the time I just start, started feeling very bad about four years ago and um, I went to many doctors and they ran tests and said everything was fine but I knew that everything was not fine and it took me about well about a year and a half to actually get diagnosed with thyroid imbalance so I'm actually going to pull up. I'm going to read some of the symptoms. I guess I'm not completely prepared. Um, but before we get started talking about how you can lose weight when you have a thyroid issue, I want to ask if you have downloaded my free guide to look and feel great over 40, the five secrets to looking and feeling great over 40. I put a link in the live stream notes and you should check it out. And I just realized I didn't close my door and my kids are kind of screaming. So hopefully you do not get into, do not hear that. So how to know if you have a thyroid issue? So one for me, it was extreme fatigue that that came up for me. Um, I'm like pulling up all of the the um, the symptoms. So unrefreshing sleep and fatigue, depression and anxiety weight gain or inability to lose weight, water retention. I had some weight gain and it was difficult to lose it. I had a lot of water retention, dry and itchy skin, dry, brutal hair and nails. I still have this. I've never recovered from it. Hair loss, lateral third of the eyebrow thinning. So out here, it's thinning. I don't think I really had that. Um, voice deepens or sound hoarse. I think I have that. Headaches, muscle aches and cramps cold intolerance, I still have issues with this, low sex drive, depressed immune system, chronic infection, slow wound healing, constipation, and digestive problems. Um, so there is a lot of symptoms. I'm going to talk, be talking mostly tonight about hypothyroidism, which is low thyroid. Hyperthyroidism is excess thyroid hormone, and actually one of the symptoms of that can be weight loss. So I'm talking about how you're going to have a difficulty losing weight. So I'm going to close my door real quick. So let's get down to it. First of all, you need to balance your thyroid hormones from either lifestyle changes or medication if your goal is to lose weight. It's really, it's going to be very difficult if you do not balance those hormones because the thyroid slowing in of itself, that's what's causing the weight gain. So unless you can change it, you know, you're, you're going to be stuck. So I want to talk about tonight, you're going to hear four things. The hidden causes for thyroid dysfunction that your doctor may have missed. So 
maybe you are already on thyroid medication, but you're not able to lose weight still. So there could still be an, a reason why you have thyroid dysfunction. How stress and unresolved trauma contribute to thyroid dysfunction, the right diet to help you lose weight without deprivation, and how to choose a doctor that can help you. So the first thing is, is to check for secondary infections. So some of you may have, who are on this live stream or watch this live stream, um, there's hypothyroidism, hypothyroidism, and then there's also like a huge epidemic of people who are not being diagnosed with Hashimoto's disease, which is an autoimmune condition in which your body attacks your thyroid gland. I do not have this or I have not been diagnosed with it, but my one of my best friends has this condition and it's crazy how many people have it and they're really undiagnosed. So there could be some hidden causes for this and let me, one of them is a secondary infection. So Hashimoto's is an autoimmune disease in which your body attacks the thyroid. And it's not a single chronic disease, but it's a symptom of an immune system, your immune system, that has broken down as a result of one or more possible causes. So you could have a secondary infection that is causing your symptoms. And here are the three main secondary infections that have been linked to Hashimoto's. So one is the Epstein-Barr virus. So I don't know, I have heard a lot about Epstein-Barr just being in the health and wellness field. If you guys have heard of the medical medium, um, he's, got, he's got like a really huge bestseller. He talks a lot about Epstein-Barr virus and that is the virus that causes mono. So I didn't even know that I had mono until I got a blood test in my 20s and it showed up that I had ha I had the antibodies or I showed that I had it. Um, so you may have even had this virus and not even known it, but it is known, it can stay dormant in your body and when it gets activated by certain things, mostly by diet or by outside stress or it could be from diet, that it can cause issues. So, oh, I just got dis distracted because someone did a thumbs up. So thank you for doing a thumbs up. So Epstein-Barr, can that, that dormant virus that can get activated can cause a lot of issues. And one of them is it can trigger, trigger Hashimoto's. So the second one is Yersinia inter enterocolitica. And it's an infectious agent found in contaminated food and water. So we're exposed to lots of stuff that, you know, bacteria and parasites quite often. And this is one that can cause problems. So it would take, a, take your doctor testing for this and it can be treated by antibiotics to get rid of it. And then the next one is, hel <laughs> obviously, this does not roll off the tongue for me. Hel it's H. pylori. I'm not going to say the first word, but it's I've, it, people usually say H. pylori. And it's found in the GI tract of about two-thirds of the, of the population, of the world's population. But it can cause ulcers in susceptible people. And it can also trigger Hashimoto's, which is going to cause a thyroid issue. So check for secondary infections and you, I'll talk a little bit at the end about how you can choose a doctor because not all doctors are going to look for that. Okay, heal your gut. I cannot speak enough about gut health. 70% of your body's immune system is found in your gut. So gut dysfunction runs rampant these days as a result of one, frequent use of antibiotics, which I have had. Um, environmental toxins, poor diets based on processed foods and high sugar, and then stress. Yes, stress can also affect your gut. And that is a huge thing that I'm going to talk about. Oh, H. pylori. I'm saying that right, Donna, right? H. pylori. Yes, I can't say the first, I can't say the first, the first word um, that, yes, it's an infectious disease. So, Sorry, I got distracted by that a little bit. So gut dysfunction runs rampant. And if you have IBS and irritable bowel disease, excuse me, irritable bowel syndrome and IBD, which is irritable bowel disease, 
in diverticulosis, acid reflux, skin issues such as eczema, psoriasis, and allergies, you likely have a leaky gut. Um, I know that I have been on a lot of antibiotics in my past. Now I like, avoid antibiotics at all possible. I have natural means to get over um, sinus infections and stuff like that. But the more you take antibiotics, it's killing the good bacteria in your gut. And I feel like that's pretty common for people to know. So if you guys don't know that, hit a comment because, or if you have heard of it, let me know because I do feel like, you know, it's all out there. You see a lot of ads for probiotics now, but you know, some people might not know that a lot of use of antibiotics is really going to cause, although it does help you and it can save people's lives, it can cause a lot of harm. And that is which it can strip your gut lining and remove the good bacteria. And you need to have some bacteria in your gut to be healthy. So, and then also processed foods. I'm sure you've heard of that. That can cause issues. And then all of the sugar, all of the hidden sugars that enter our diet also causes gut dust dysfunction. And what happens is, is that this causes leaky gut. And leaky gut is when the gut barrier breaks down from the reasons I listed above, and it leaves little holes in our intestines. So this allows larger particles from undigested food particles and toxins, pathogens, and things like that into our digestive system. So this overloads the immune system, and that over, over time leads to gut dysfunction. And it causes Maybe you guys have heard about, it seems like everybody these days has food sensitivities and food allergies, and this is caused from leaky gut. So it allows these particles from these top allergens to get into our, into our intestines, and it causes a lot of issues. So the common allergens are gluten, dairy, soy, tomato, peanuts, corn, and eggs. So I'll repeat this again when I talk about diet, but the first thing I recommend anybody who has a thyroid issue, Hashimoto's or not, is to remove gluten and dairy from your diet. If you can't do dairy, at least start with gluten. See how you feel after a couple of weeks and then try dairy and just call it an experiment. It doesn't have to be for the rest of your life, um, but just see how you react because Many times we have low levels of inflammation in our body and we don't realize it's the certain foods that we're eating that are causing problems and it's not until we remove them that we see a change. So there's four steps to repairing or fixing gut dysfunction. So that means number one, take away irritating foods for a while. Like I just explained, I would start with gluten and dairy. If you want to go the whole gamut, you would do all of the top allergens, such as soy, tomato, peanuts, corn, and eggs. Um, then you would restore digestion by using digestive enzymes with meals to help with proper digestion. And then the third step would be adding back in good bacteria through probiotics, probiotics and fermented foods, such as yogurt, sauerkraut, kimchi. It's like all the range, right? All the rage right now, kombucha. And I do like kombucha. It is a fermented drink or it does have um, probiotics in it. But you need to watch out for that because there's a lot of sugar in kombucha as well. Um, kefir is another, is another fermented drink. It's based on dairy. I think you, you can get um, non-dairy kefir, but that has a lot of good probiotics in it as well. And obviously a good probiotic. And then the fourth step would be repairing the gut. So some supplements that help this are L-glutamine, and that helps restore the stomach lining, and omega-3 fish oils that help reduce inflammation. So you could take a supplement, and you could also add more omega-3 fish oils into your diet, like from salmon. So that's my little two cents. If you have not looked at your gut as being contributing to your thyroid issue or to your symptoms and inability to lose weight, take a look at that. Okay, number three, reduce your stress. I cannot speak about this enough. Stress can be good. Stress keeps us alive. It has kept us alive for um, since the dawn of man. 
It keeps us alive in fight or flight situations. If we're in an emergency, if we need to save our child or running away from bears or someone with a knife or a gun, it's great. But the problem is, is, oh, some of the symptoms of leaky gut. Very good. Okay, I'm going to go back to that. I, I have a few books that I'm going to recommend to you guys. I have used as my notes for this live stream. Um, but also in my own research, you know, before I became a coach and I wanted to learn about thyroid dysfunction because whenever I have something that I see as a problem, I am like all about fixing it and I want to get as educated as possible. So the first book is The Complete Thyroid Health and Diet Guide by Dr. Nicholas Hedberg. I found him just by doing a, a search. He's really a brilliant functional medical doctor or he's in functional medicine. And then The Autoimmune Solution by Dr. Amy Myers. She talks all about autoimmune disorders. So here, let me pull up leaky gut symptoms. So, you know, there is like a huge, I don't know, debate. I mean, it depends on the doctor you go to because many doctors don't subscribe to, especially traditional doctors, do not subscribe to leaky gut as even being a thing. So, but... I do not, I mean, it is a thing. So, ugh. here. Okay, well, headaches, migraines, faintness, trouble sleeping, brain fog, poor memory, impaired coordination, diff difficulty deciding. Um, nasal congestion is a huge thing. That can be a sign of chronic candida overgrowth, which is happens when you take a lot of antibiotics and it allows, we all have candida in our intestines, but when you take away the good bacteria, it, it, it like allows it to grow. Um, so excessive mucus, stuffy runny nose, sinus problems, itchy ears, chronic cough, frequent throat clearing, um, digestion, con constipation, IBS is a sign of a leaky gut, heartburn, intestinal stomach pain or cramps, and inability to lose weight could be part of it. Food cravings, um, a lot of skin issues like acne, hives, eczema, dry skin, and such. So, and I think asthma is also some breathing issues is a, is a symptom of that as well. So there's a lot of symptoms. So I suggest if you guys have any issues, if after you eat, you get bloated and have gas, if you have indigestion, um, I would definitely look into the leaky gut connection. So this, I mean, if you don't think you have an autoimmune disease, you don't necessarily have to read this, but this is a great resource. Okay, so going back to talking about our gut contributes to our inability to lose weight for anybody but especially if you have a thyroid condition. And I'm going to move on to stress. So I was talking about how stress can be good. It keeps us alive in fight or flight situations. But the problem is, is these days we have, all of us have such stress that is constant. Low, um, it's like when you're in a fight or flight situation, you have that rush of adrenaline and then it wears off. But when you start getting stressed out and have that rush of adrenaline about normal things that are happening to you in your daily life, like your traffic, um, stress about balancing everything in your life, a full-time job, kids, um, your husband, problems at work, that causes that cortisol from that adrenaline spike. It causes the stress hormone cortisol to be constantly elevated in your body. So what happens is, is that starts breaking down your body and starts breaking down your immune system. So if you have an autoimmune disease, which Hashimoto's disease, Hashimoto's thyroid, the thyroid issue, or excuse me, thyroiditis, if you're having stress breaking, all that cortisol breaking down your body and your immune system, it's definitely going to worsen your condition with Hashimoto's. That's the same with any autoimmune disorder because I do have an auto, autoimmune disorder and it's completely triggered by stress. So over time, when you have all these elevated levels of stress, of cortisol, your body gets desensitized to it. So then it stops producing it as much. So low cortisol can 
um, lead to adrenal dysfunction. And that, the symptoms of that, so low cortisol from adrenal dysfunction, and that disrupts thyroid function. So it's all tied in together. So higher cortisol levels cause thyroid hormone receptors be, to become less sensitive, but then eventually it causes adrenal fatigue, which causes you to crave salt, wake up exhausted in the morning, and makes you rely, rely on caffeine. So when you have a lot of stress, when you have either too low cortisol or too high of cortisol, you, when you have a, adrenal dysfunction, a stress it includes exercise and intense dieting. When you're at really low calories and you're dieting intensely, that raises your cortisol as well. It also disrupts your sleep, and when you don't have good sleep, that increases your cortisol. So, and also when you have intense exercise, like a lot of hit, high intensity. What, why couldn't I remember? Um, high intensity interval training which is common in boot camps or CrossFit. So boot camp style like Orange Theory or, you know, there's tons of boot camp places. Your, your body is under stress if you're exercising at a really high intensity for a long time. So that's actually going to worsen your, your condition. So one of the things I had to learn when I, you know, when I've been healing from my hypothyroidism and adrenal dysfunction, which I also have, is that I can't overdo it. I am a chronic overexerciser, and especially if you're a woman who gets very concerned about the weight gain, because that makes us feel bad about ourselves, just that's the way it is. Um, we're like, we need to work out, we need to work out more, we need to eat less, because you want to lose this weight, come hell or high water but that actually is putting more stress on your body and causing even more problems. So what do you do? So you're going to need to focus on self-care. You're going to need to scale back on the exercise. Um, I would, if you are, have extreme issues with exhaustion, fatigue, I would cut back cardio pretty much totally except for walking or yoga. And if you're going to do anything, I would do, moderate strength training because strength training is the best form of exercise in my opinion. It helps you build muscle and burn fat and it's it's less harsh on your body than intense cardio exercise, just in my opinion, than running or something like that. Meditation is really important, so being able to reduce your stress through meditation I recommend all my clients download the, the app called Calm, and it is very beneficial because they it's for beginners and they have tons of guided med meditations. You're going to want to avoid emotional stresses. So I just used to like blow off stress and like think it's part of life, but it's not just part of life, and it can't be if you have a thyroid condition, and especially if you have an autoimmune condition because it it breaks down your body even more. So you have to figure out ways to manage your stress. And then this is something that many people don't know, but old trauma. Um, many women develop <laughs> Hashimoto's after they have a child, and it's very common for them to have trauma in their past. And when we do psychosomatic work, meaning we put a feeling to that trauma or whatever thing that is keeping them stuck in life, many times the feeling is in their throat. And guess where your thyroid is? It's in your throat. So holding on to, to lots of pain and suffering from the past and thinking you're over it and you're not really over it and you've never really cleared the energy from your body, you may or may not believe me, but it is true it causes chronic disease, which of which hypothyroidism and Hashimoto's is. So that's something that you're, most doctors aren't going to talk to you about and something I would suggest to look at if you're having difficulty losing weight. Because actually, Donna, who, if you're still on here, you can be a testament to some of the work that we did in the program about releasing old trauma and you – definitely felt that it contributed to weight loss. So something to, to think about. All right, 
I'm going to talk about diet. So just a really easy rule of thumb is to eat for your body type. So there's really no one size fits all diet for anyone in any case and especially for thyroid issues. But there are general rules of thumb just based on your body type and what your metabolism does and how your body reacts that could help you lose weight more easily. So the three body types are an endomorph and that's someone who's maybe short and stocky. They gain fat very easily, but they also can gain muscle very easily. They're typically called a slow metabolism. So they're more insulin resistant and they don't have a very good tolerance for carbohydrates. So they can benefit from a lower carbohydrate diet, but not keto. Um, and I'm gonna explain why. So I'm gonna go into that keto is like a huge fad right now. Everybody's jumping on the keto bandwagon um, because it is a really great way to lose a lot of weight very quickly, but it can be very counterintuitive to someone who has a thyroid issue. So a ketogenic diet that goes on too long can lead to decreased free T3 levels. And that's one of the thyroid hormones. Our bodies start burning fat, but also to convert, conserve energy, they lower our T3 levels, which can cause more thyroid imbalance. So my suggestion is, is eating a lower carbohydrate diet, um, less than like around 25. You could like go from start at 30% and lower down to maybe 20% to see how it goes. But I would start as high as you can. 30% um, of your calories that you eat from carbohydrates. The next type of body is an ectomorph, and they're usually tall and skinny. They tolerate carbs a lot better. They have a fast metabolism. They find it hard to gain weight. So they would do better on a higher carbohydrate diet, which is 50%, I would say 50% of their calories. And the last type of body is a mesomorph, and that's a typically athletic body. They gain muscle easily, but they do gain fat more easily than an ectomorph. They've got broad shoulders, and they do better with a moderate carbohydrate diet. So you want to balance your blood sugar by eating low glucose flu foods. And I hope I'm not getting too confusing, but glucose comes from carbohydrates. So you're going to want to eat a low, a low GI. Um, yeah, a low GI type of carbohydrate diet. So that means legumes, that means carbo slower burning carbohydrates like sweet potato or whole grains. And I want to talk, so whole grains, but not gluten. So we want to try to avoid gluten. Um, so let me pull up some low GI carbs just to give you guys some examples. Fruit would be in there, some fruits. Because when I'm on the spot here, I'm like not remembering off the top of my head all the low GI foods. So that would be like obviously any type of vegetable. Well, a higher type of vegetable would be potatoes or french fries or pumpkin. Um, so fruit, kiwi fruit, coconut, grapes, coconut milk, pears, orange, strawberries, apples. You get what I'm saying. Legumes like kidney beans, pinto beans, chickpeas. Um, but if you listen to Amy Myers, I don't want to, I guess I'm getting confusing. She says no legumes. There's different schools of thought. So rolled oats, oat bran, all bran. And I mean, there are brown rice, buckwheat. I don't know. That might be gluten based. So. My suggestion to everyone is to avoid gluten, to eat a lower GI carbohydrates, and to eat enough protein. So you have to fill up your diet with something if you're eating lower carbs, if you're watching that. So I suggest at least 20% of your calories are coming from a good source of protein. And then just depending on your body type, an endomorph who's stockier, who gains fat very easily, they actually tolerate eating a lot more fat. Ectomorphs, they would eat the tall and skinny person, they would eat less fat, and then a mesomorph can eat a moderate fat. So eat for your body type, but hold the keto.
And then the final, what I wanted to talk about, I've been going on and on forever, and my family's probably wondering where I'm at, is why so often doctors miss thyroid conditions. So, hey Kate, how are you? So most doctors use pathological ranges to diagnose thyroid issues, and patholog pathological ranges are the averages of all the people who have had blood work by that lab for the past year. So this means that the guidelines for diagnosing a thyroid condition are based on all the people who, who, well, okay, I'm like repeating. So most of who we can assume are in some degree of poor health, because if they're going to get their blood work, they're probably in poor health. So what's more is that many of them already have a thyroid condition, and so they're on a thyroid medication. So that skews the results even more. So when, there, when you have not been diagnosed with a thyroid condition and you're being compared to all these other people who may or may not be in, in good health and already have a thyroid condition, it means that doctors are missing the ranges. And also, I've found that it's a very individual to the person. I showed symptoms of a thyroid issue for like a year and a half before my blood work even well, again, I was seeing naturopaths, and they still were not saying that my levels were off. But now, knowing what I know, I can, can, I can compare my thyroid levels to that of the pathological range and even the functional doctor's range, and they still weren't off. So I was seeing symptoms before my blood levels even showed it. So just because you've been told, even though you, you might feel like crap, and you might meet all of the symptoms of thyroid issues, but you keep being told that you don't have a thyroid issue, that doesn't mean that you don't. So let me go on to how to choose a doctor. So just based on what I have been talking all about tonight, it's very obvious that thyroid issues really encompass the whole body, is the whole body is a, is a system. Many different things can affect your thyroid function. So my suggestion is to find a doctor that views your body as a, as a system and not just treats individual symptoms of an issue. Um, there are, you know, different schools of thought with different doctors, but, and I also urge you, if you feel like something is off with your thyroid based on the symptoms that I had suggested, to not give up, to keep, to keep searching for a doctor that will listen and help you through the symptoms. So that's my top recommendation. Just a doctor that views the body as a system and is educated on these other ways that secondary infections and how gut health can affect thyroid function. So I hope this was helpful. Thanks for tuning in. And just as a reminder, if you haven't yet, Please download my free guide to the or for the five secrets of looking and feeling great over 40. All right, talk to you later.